auch der Person war, kam ich zu Nina Kappes, who is a lecturer in English and I'm writing at the AIDT, the Institute of Art, Design and Technology in Missouri. She also wrote at the Crocodile by the Door, which is a memoir about farming sheep in Dublin Mountains, which was shortlisted for the UK Cop Dublin Award and for Games, and the Gosh, Gosh, for the Board Gosh, and the Irish Book Award in 2012. She is the editor of the new Irish Poet in 2004, and Joseph Curtis co edited the Reflection Manuscript Materials by Ricky Bradley Gates for the Cargo of the Gates series in 2011. Her current research interests are focused on contemporary narrative practice and the interface between auto fiction and visual arts, which is with a particular emphasis on naturality, landscape, and ethical practices. So I hand it over to you and look forward to this. Thank you very much. Thank you. Um, and thank you to Christian. I, I think that I we are these papers are going to sing together quite nicely. Um, because I'm also going to be talking about uh, agro agronomics, really. Um, but from the position of being a, a fairly marginal, um, it, participating in a fairly marginal livestock enterprise, which is sheep. So although I'm a lecturer, I'm also a sheep farmer. And pictured here is a Suffolk hybrid lamb. The tag in its ear shows the national identifier, my flock number and the animal number. And this sheep, I would say, is a barely profitable animal. Um, it will be slaughtered in Ireland at Kildare Chilling Factory to be consumed in France. The factory demands that our lambs kill out to 22 kilograms dead weight to ensure that four cutlets neatly fit inside a standard supermarket tray. Other metrics of death are available, but this is the one that puts food on my family's table. What kinship then can this shit producing livestock unit and my sheep is only, uh, there's a livestock unit is one cow or 6.66 sheep. So this is only part of the livestock unit that you're looking at. What kinship then can this livestock unit itself very insecurely commodified these days and caps current market terms and cap is the common agricultural policy in caps current market terms what kinship can it look to have with the shitless fabled animals that animate the symbolic realm in our national imaginary beyond dreams of rewilding how should we in the environmental humanities engage with those agrarians who still rely on grass-based pastoral systems for their income when few family farms outside of dairy achieve a living wage through raising livestock. This paper is going to suggest that when relationality is recognized as the core object of epistemological inquiry in these times of ecological collapse, transnationalist, transdisciplinary, and most vitally intersectoral conversations should come to the fore. This word I'm going to suggest has transformative implications for area-based studies. Now, in spring 2022, the Royal Hibernian Academy held a group show of seven Irish female artists whose expanded practice explicitly engages with agriculture, primarily focused on livestock enterprises. A growing inquiry, art and agriculture reconciling values, we stopped the visually oversaturated Irish landscape or those green fields that Christian spoke of with the material commodities of agricultural trade, a fertilizer spreader, a wire tractor, and various byproducts of meat trade appeared in the gallery. These byproducts included wool, tallow, straws for collecting bull semen. These featured among the exhibits. For me, this exhibition was a model of Haraway's tentacular thinking, and this paper is informed by my own experience of farming sheep and writing about them, while investigating how the presentation of livestock in gallery spaces disrupts post-Arcadian and implicitly patriarchal stereotypes of Irish rurality. So, Recently, I've been thinking about how a renewed focus on materiality in expanded practice offers a site of situated and embodied knowledge that is resistant to the ecocidal and unsustainable digitization of experience in this era of great acceleration. 
Inspired by Haraway's attention to the generative joy inherent to mapping new ecologies of practice, I'm going to focus on two artists, Maria McKinney and Orla Barry. And I want to think with, both of these artists think with and alongside livestock in their recent projects. So wool, shit, milk and semen, the materiality of these substances, their function in cycles of sustenance, the shame and expense of their waste when consumer lust gets redirected by extractivist industries. These are the animal materials I bring to the table. So this uh, slide shows Maria McKinney with a cow at an agricultural show. This is uh, not just a, a piece of play, this is actually an art performance. And this multimedia project named Sire resulted from an 18-month residency for Donegal artist Maria McKinney at the UCD Parity Studios in 2015. Now, where STEAM collaborations are generally regarded as a good thing for everyone, there, are, there are, recently have been some concerns expressed in the art world about the implicit hierarchies to this collaboration. So a recent article in Freeze queried, um, queried this, asking, in such contexts, that is collaboration between researchers and artists in such contexts, does the artist work with the scientist in a symmetrical collaboration between equals, or is the artist working for the scientist to help disseminate their findings? Or is the scientist in fact working for the artist who comes to represent the wider societal good, sorry, the wider social context of the public good and its corollary public opinion? Or is it all or none of these? In this case, I suggest that the transgressive praxis in McKinney's work stems from a quiet regendering of the dynamic between artist, subject, and handler, which is designed to unsettle a traditionally patriarchal scientific hubris. Working with prize bulls at the, at the Devea stud farm in Tipperary, McKinney resituates the gendered battles fought by May's armies over the stud bull Don Cunha inside the flesh of the animal itself, as you will see. So this is one of McKinney's artworks. Um, the loom band structure of the X chromosome is woven from the plastic straws used for storing bull semen by the AI industry. And AI here is artificial <laughs> insemination. <laughs> These bulls, all non-native breeds, do not get to cover cows, but have their semen stripped by handlers in a close moment of interspecies cooperation. <laughs> Sar effectively turns these icons of machismo into plinths for exhibiting the genetic material expressed through the phenotype in their physique. If I click here, should I click here? <laughs> if I click here, you will see, no. ah yes, good. You will see the characteristics. You can't, you can't see it. Oh, you can't see it. Oh, I do beg your pardon. You're very good. Do you want me to help? I think it's, uh, I think it's, no, uh, yes, that one. Uh, uh, yes, that one. Perfect. I think. <laughs> yeah. It's one of them. Anyway, you get the idea that basically these are the characteristics that the stud farm is going to prioritize. Ah, oh, it's actually inside. It doesn't matter. So we'll come back to that. Uh, can I come back to my. Oh, Perfect. Sorry. So there's been technical issues. I've been done all this all week. So I apologize. Mm. Okay, let me just go back to that slide there. Perfect, and then we'll start again, and I may meet you by my side. <laughs> um, yes, you are so beautiful. Okay, so uh, the artwork, sorry, if I go back a, a section here, perfect, we're up. The artwork then should be understood to comprise both the structure on the animal's back and the bull itself, right? Because the bull effectively is a form of genomic one, it's a genomic wonder. In his essay, Genomic Natures Read Through Posthumanism, Richard Twine states that transhumanism attempts to render materiality economically intelligible, helping to interweave science and capital, promoting new accumulation strategies. One phrase he uses to describe the advent of laboratory genomics appears particularly pertinent to McKinney's work, and that is the focus of the eye of accumulation has turned molecular. 
And I would suggest the particular power of SIRE is to render this focus visible and simultaneously absurd. <coughs> so, this interweaving of science and capital, identified by Twine as a feature of late capitalism, is given a longer genealogy by the craft employed here. A collection of corn dollies in the National Museum of Country Life inspired McKinney to employ the same straw binding techniques in making her sculptures. Straw from the final sheaf of the year's harvest is woven into a figure, and this figure is buried with the seed to ensure the spring crop prospers. It's a practice that happens all over Europe. McKinney continues, in contemporary society, however, the branch of knowledge known as genomics has given humans the ability to truly influence how nature behaves in future generations of animal and plant species. This body of work, SIRE, is proposed as a rephrasing of what was once intangible. Now we not only understand these formerly mysterious processes of propagation, but also manipulate them to our own ends. This ability is in itself a cause of wonderment. The if commodification relies on dematerializing labor, McKinney's sculptures pull aside the country's cloak. Sire's origins, however, in these straw figures lend an elegiac undertow pointing to the threat of material redundancy that is intrinsic to the genomic project. In Irish, the word kylock, here meaning the last straw, is also applied to an unmarried woman and on to denote a hag and a witch. This etymological swerve, and thank you, Jessica, for the term, <laughs> points to what Haraway identifies as the quick dreams that shadow transhumanist ambitions. These dreams are of procreation without the risk of anatomical entanglement with real female bodies. So the pop-coloured range of colours in these straws has a function, allowing researchers to quickly match specimen and bull in the laboratory's deep freeze. Richard Twine suggests that the genomic sequencing of livestock to improve breeding characteristics requires a distancing from the sensual presence of animal bodies that echoes the distance achieved by the consumer in the conversion of animals into the category of meat. Now, I'm not sure this dis distancing ac accurately reflects the intimate practice of tending to these prize bulls, which lead a fairly charmed life. The unnamed male handlers in these photographs hold the named bull with arm's reach and may indeed regard him with alert respect. But you'd be wrong, I think, to read their presence as just a glimpse of interspecies connection. If I click through yet another one of these indexes, and it may be the same one that I showed you earlier. Is this right? Yes, it is. Yeah, you will see actually here that one of the things they are reading for is docility. Mm -hmm. And so the rage is literally being bred out of the bull. Mm -hmm. So that's what the presence of the handlers testifies to, is the fact that these bulls can be handled. Mm -hmm. While the woven AI straws in SIRE make the visualization of data beautiful and are arguably perhaps complicit with the dissemination of funded genomic research, these structures also express anxiety about what happens when the eye of accumulation narrows in on the future of any species at molecular level. The transubstantiation of data into bestial flesh accords with prionic ambitions to overcome the natural limitations of accidental selection. Do these bulls regard themselves as trans-animalist wonders, exemplary models of a post-bovine future? Is this even a legitimate question? As critical post-humanists point out, transhumanism in its extropian form relies on a reading of the material world as information, rele relegating the experiential body to a secondary tier, an inferior site of production. Inside this bioinformatic economy, situated knowledge is overshadowed by the constant threat of obsolescence and redundancy. As the xenotransplantation of pig organs into human bodies attest, Farm animals, particularly pigs, fulfill dual functions both as food and production units for medical research. The science McKinney depicts then reaches beyond the veterinary school and into human bodies, closing the genetic gap between stockman and livestock, between consumer and meat, 
between human skin and the skins we wear. The HRT of my mother's generation relied on the urine of pregnant mares to provide a compatible estrogen. So, how does this all impact on the farm? Many of the livestock farmers I know experience this displacement of husbandry as an enduring grief without being quite able to pinpoint the site of loss. In the cow book, John Connell's tale of returning to help run the family farm in Longford, he describes the department's decision to upgrade the bloodlines of the national herd through the use of AI in the following terms. So far, there has been a lot of resistance to this new system for farmers have spent generations breeding up their herds to a point where they are happy. The new system does not favor self-breeding. Rory, our neighbor, calls it a monopoly by the genetics companies to impose their sperm banks on farmers. Now, all sires breeds, all the breeds that McKinney pictures are continental, Frisians, Simmental, Charolais, and these are heavy cattle, little suited for long rushy fields. And there is concern at the mart about the reliability of that docility index. The note I hear threaded through these conversations is grief at the loss of interspecies kinship, the kind invoked by Connell here. So he here talks about calling cows as a form of oral culture, and I'll just let you read that yourselves. The language he describes using brings the haptic geography of the farm closer, a series of habitual sounds produced in the human body to produce reaction and movement in the herd. And ultimately, these noises articulate attachment. <laughs> and it's to this sense of kinship, this mutuality, mutuality of be being that I want to turn now. So I'm gonna use this reef, this coral reef, famous crocheted coral reef to change species. As Penelope would attest, weaving is a female and often a strategically feminist art, and to weave molecular structures out of plastic semen straws presents a teasingly feminist visual joke. I read McKinney's sculptures as the visual embodiment of what I would propose is the rhetorical trope for Irish animal studies, and that is an Irish bull. A ludicrous, incongruent, or logically absurd statement, generally unrecognized as such by its author, subject always to Mahaffey's warning that an Irish bull is always pregnant. <laughs> in 2010, I visited this crochet coral reef in the Trinity Science Gallery, and perhaps McKinney did too. This fiber arts project created by 25,000 volunteer crafters supplies Haraway with a key example of tentacular thinking in staying with the trouble. Um, and there's more I could say about it, but I'm gonna to have to move on. Uh, what I want to do is to take the wool from the reef and move on to a sheep. So I'm next gonna talk about Walla Barry, and this is Walla here. Oh, you can't see Walla. Okay, this is Walla here, and this is her uh, clean. Um, and it is a, um, don't worry about changing the, it's okay. uh, uh, but effectively, um, last year a film came out by the director Cara Holmes, uh, which is an hour-long documentary about Paula's relationship with her sheep. Um, she is a pedigree, clin, she's a pedigree clin farmer, so this is a clin breed, this is a Welsh breed, it's white, but she also has a few, uh, what in Ireland are called swarble sheep, but in fact it's uh, they are um, uh, Dutch sheep bred for dairy farming, and she keeps a few of those as well. And notes from Sheepland, Cara Holmes's film documents this hard-won integration of arts practice and shepherding in Barry's life and work. So Barry lived um, for 16 years in Brussels, where she worked as a speech and performance-based conceptual artist before she returned to the family farm in County Wexford and turned the tillage fields over to pastures for sheep. <laughs> um, so Barry insists that her pedigree flock, and she is a, a judge around, agricultural shows that her pedigree flock should be considered as much an artwork as the other projects I'm going to show you here. So this is one of Barry's early works. It's uh, uh, called Golden Pocket, which is not that early, sorry, 2017. 
So Barry's dyslexia is unexceptional among visual artists. And this work, Golden Pocket, demonstrates her acute attention to how the self in relation is semantically constrained. At the center stands Rui Chavez's biomorphic figure, a hybrid creature that can belong to either the animal or plant kingdom. That's this shadow in here. Um, the phrase, so to come face to face with this non-human being is to negotiate a textile spiral with diagrams and network phrases that label different intersectional and intersubjective positions. And the phrase Shane Rapunzel, which is Barry's recurring name for Sean Yeo, is connected to various other things, including multicultural, multicolored animal genes. Um, I want to move ahead to another couple of her works. When so much of the text we consume has only digital shape and is stored in data centers that are exponentially more ecocidal than parchment and paper, these nine felt works made by Barry from nine named shearlings, and these are the names of the sheep. Um, these uh, felt works restore the labor of the body to the text, not just the female body, but the named animal body too. So form is destroyed in the breakdown of fibers required in felting, and in felt or feeling work too, a somatic openness to encounter with radical alterity also requires a breakdown in fibers of ego, of sexuality, of boundaries to produce the eco. And form too is obviously destroyed in this capitalist scene era by extractivist industries whose synthetic fibers displace a core commodity in sheep production, and that is raw wool. So I just want to play you a quick clip here. I'm aware that I'm up against the clock. To give you an idea of her performance work, not this, um, the link that's here. No, it's here. So I just want to explain to you how her collaborative practice takes place. I should say this is kind of like a, a <laughs> compendium. He's acting, he's acting the part of a ram. <laughs> and it's a gender battle. This is the shepherd. Okay, I think I'll stop. <laughs> um, so, uh, just to kind of conclude, I, I'm sorry to run on. Um, 
Oh, if I could just uh, keep her quiet. Um, so I just uh, want to conclude really to say that where pastoral visions in the Romantic era were anchored in autochthonous ideas of the nation, Barry's collaboration here with the Israeli performer Einak Tuchman, who you saw, his first language is Hebrew, really is um, a, a kind of non-native practice. The text, the text that she performs range from the kind of uh, lived experience of Barry uh, as a farmer. And um, Barry, the way it happens is that Barry tells these stories to Einat, Einat learns them, repeats them back to Barry, Barry then adapts the text again. And so the way that Barry sums it is to say, Einat, my ideas are in Einat's body. So this idea of a foreign woman voicing an Irish shepherd's lived experience, telling it back to the shepherd, who then inscribes the tale as a hybrid and composite text, is a form of radical estrangement from many of the ideas that we have anchoring our sense of the pastoral as a particularly Irish uh, practice. So I'm just going to say thank you very much. I would love to play you out with a song performed by a ram who is being shorn by the female shepherd, but I think I'll leave that pleasure to another time. So thank you very much. So thank you both. It was really inspiring. I might say, like, I opened a talk today, but I would say uh, we have 10 minutes for questions. Are there any questions? Yeah. Thank you both for a really wonderful, insightful talks. I absolutely agree. I have a, a more of a kind of a conceptual um, question um, and really out of curiosity, because then you mentioned um, and you historicized it, um, this entire history of the pasture and, and how it developed in the period of plantations and um, 16th century kind of English um, settlements. However, and I'm not sure if you avoided it or if it was a coincidence, um, you didn't really frame it in a, in a colonial framework. And I was just interested, it was very much about politics, economics, and, so on. and it was obvious from, um, from um, the sources that you cited and the kind of the English um, look on or look at um, Ireland as the kind of the, uh, the producer and so on. But just out of curiosity, um, was it something that um, you think where post-colonialism is perhaps not really useful, not really what you, um, kind of the point, or was it kind of implicit and it just the term um, didn't come up? Well, it's in a way it is implicit, but on the other hand, I wanted to foreground, I didn't want to foreground it because I think, for example, uh, it's more complicated than that. It's, mm -hmm. it's, it's, there's obviously the frame, and I, you know, the, I, I, I said that the text, especially the descriptions of Irish nature, are obviously colonial product because they describe the land for, you know, if we use the gender traits, you know. Describe the poor rights of like the, the maid of the camel, I don't know that. And um, uh, yeah, and but um, but actually, it's not English and Irish people, but the the the, the tenant graziers, like the the, the the tenants who then it's 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 Irish people who are doing that. Mm -hmm. So, it, but they're working within a context. Of yes, maybe colonialism, but they're um, they're working within the context of emerging uh, capital relations. So mm -hmm. I think that's the more forceful power here than to say it's the English who brought that, mm -hmm. um, because it's um, in that context that the tenant grazers that are that are that are mentioned here build up stocks. Mm -hmm. Those are local people emerging from local power structures, you know, because there were power structures before. Uh, and these these continue within to the colonial uh, uh, period. Mm -hmm. So it's certain Irish people who have the ability to build up stocks, and it's other Irish people who do not have the ability um, to build up stocks and then are pushed mm -hmm. from the from from, the, from their land. Yeah. Can I come in on the back of that, which is to say that you you focused a lot on uh, quite rightly on the tenant grazing system within the southeast of the country, and of course one of the things that is rarely mentioned in terms of those colonial analyses mm -hmm. of Ireland is that in the 1860s and 1870s, uh, many of those farmers, um, not many, but a sizable portion of those farmers, moved to Argentina to cut down forests and actually establish very large cattle ranches. So, in fact, Ireland has a history of itself Absolutely. being a colonial power. Absolutely. 
and, and that was my hunch, and that's why I'm asking. Yeah. I thought it's a wonderful case uh, in point that uh, postcolonialism as a framework, you know, it, it's too one-sided almost, and kind of taking this um, the bottom-up um, view. So you, you see how complicated it is. So the question of Ireland is postcolonial and so on. So that was my my guess that uh, kind of. Yeah. Um, and and this story is even more complicated. I, I framed it a bit like it's it's a. Uh... It's underclass uh, uprising against Big Ten graduates, but it wasn't as easy as that. Because the, the, the interesting thing is that a few people of the Irish gentry were all. It isn't clear who these hackers were because they're you know a, a secret um, mm -hmm. society. Um, but the evidence, the, the little evidence that we have, suggests that it's not only underclass people, but you know as often in these kind of uprisings, mm -hmm. they are um, people from various ranks of society involved. So it's also between, no, actually it's not a clan structure anymore, but there are also different Irish families mm -hmm. involved um, you know, in this struggle against mm -hmm. each other. Some are more successful in adapting the profitable system of alternative grazing, others are less um, successful in that. They have, they all may be land that is not as um, easy to adapt to this kind of agriculture. So this is also an internal struggle between different groups of different um, uh, Spheres of the society. Thank you. I have seen a hand around here. Paul, oh, are there any questions remaining? Yeah. yeah I, I just, uh, what you said originally about the colonial post colonial race, um, I think it was politically to that what what you're probably really reminded of is uh, um, Jason Moore's work on world ecology. <laughs> The capital scene, mm -hmm. um, and it, it, really, it really kind of shouted out from your work actually that right. idea that colonial relation once spanned, but actually it's a history of capitalism and the relationship between, as you said, tenant workers, the adaptation of, of land to, uh, or the, 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 the reshaping of land as a commodity uh, and the margin as well as people. But, his work is really speaks to what you're the way you're framed. Yeah. Are you taking it, I suppose taking it away from having the colonial <laughs> paradigm as the determined feature. Like, yeah. yeah. It's made for ecology actually is far more appropriate. Yeah, yeah. Um I think um so I wouldn't go exactly with this capital cap, cap, capital scene. Um <laughs> Because as I try to show, there is the framework of, I mean, this is not capitalism yet, you know, that, because it's interesting that it's a, that it's a form of economy that's not capital based. Yeah, so there's little capital yeah. there. So it's, so it's, it was, but it's it, even, even these tenant graduates don't have capital, they build up stock over a while. Um, but, um, but I find it, it's, but it's, uh, on the other hand, I think most of these world system studies are kind of synchronous, you know, they show what happens in, former third world countries uh, in the global south and so on and so on. I think a lot of Irish history prefigures many of the things we see later on in South America or we see in India and so on and so on. So it's, and we have um, access to these developments three, four hundred years ago, which play out at the moment. So it's kind of a historical angle to this world ecology, world system ecology. Yeah. Thank you. Thank Okay. I was wondering um, how, how is this work received um, and, and who sort of is the intended audience? Mm -hmm. yeah. yeah, sorry, if I had more time, I'd expand that. So, um, okay, so Maria McKinney's work effectively has, Maria's been uh, exhibited at Venice Biennale and, you know, she, her work has uh, been exhibited in the Museum of English Royal Life. Sarah was big, a big thing for that's the situation in uh, Reading in South England. So, you know, this is um, mainstream contemporary arts practice. Mm -hmm. um, the same with, so Orla Barry's position is really interesting because effectively she's like her, her indebtedness is to New York conceptualists like Sol Witt, but also actually to Hannah Darvelman, who I think is a Bavarian born artist, um, who, um, so, and Ava, Ava Hess as well. So, but she, if you like, is a Belgian artist. She's Wexford born and bred and lives in Wexford. But the really big thing for her was Chantal Ackerman's films and diaries. I don't know if any of you 
no Chantal Ackerman, uh, but um, you know, uh, she, you know, her work is among you know the happy best films of all time. Number one, number one, yeah. Uh, so um, and Barry also that that piece has, has toured. So what I showed you was a kind of compressed initial thing called Breaking Rainbows that was expanded into an hour-long performance, uh, which was performed during the Dublin Theatre Festival, also performed down in Wexford, but it has also toured to Belgium, to Antwerp, to the Netherlands. So, you know, you're in a very mainstream art world. In fact, when I was in Amsterdam at New Year, I went to the film museum there. They had an exhibition by the Greek artist Yanis Rafa, who is also a multimedia artist whose work is entirely around um, uh, post-human landscapes and animals. So, you know, what may feel like, um, yeah, so it, it's a very mainstream concern within this multimedia, multi-performance space of contemporary visual arts. I thought at one stage you showed us an image where you said this is on an agrarian festival. Okay. Yeah, so, so, is, it, so is it the flowering or something? But that, that would yeah, be it was at the National Park. Yeah. Yeah, so Maria showed her work at the National Park. But she also goes around and like she's been, the farm say? They love it. Because actually they respond in the best way, which is they restart respond to the joy of it. So laughter is um, particularly the women. Uh, uh, you know, absolutely love the kind of joke of it. And there is a joke, but it's actually quite a, the more you think about it, that project are, the more complex it becomes, because you can go back to Ada Lovelace and the development of computation and weaving, you know, in the, you know, all of this is there in that one visual arts project. So, yeah. Thank you both. Unfortunately, we have run out of time, so thank you. To touch and point and then your question to a cafe, which will be umbrella. So I'm very pleased to introduce you to Laurent Daniel. He is a lecturer in English with the Department of Applied Languages at the University of Southern Brittany in New York. He is the current Dean of the Faculty of Arts. His main research interest is the French child and sport. And he has edited La Rue in 2009 and published Les Rivières et les Longs de la Rue de Saint-Louis in 2013, which is a book on playhouse posting from the 16th century English to the 21st century Irish. He has also published a few papers on the TAA, which is the Gallic Athletic Association. So, we really will welcome to you. Good morning, everybody, and thank you for the organizer for accepting my paper, which came so many days, so many days after the closing date, and for organizing a conference on uh, island and animals as well, because this is something I started 30 years ago, and which I finished some 15 years ago, and all along these years I couldn't ever come across any conference oh, on the subject. <laughs> but this is a kind of overview of what I did. Uh, during those uh, few years back in the early noughties. Um, so in the words of a 19th century field sports writer, at a time when no need for justification was felt, the greyhound is the most artificial and helpless of dogs, but the most perfect animal for the special sport for which he is bred. It is helpless uh, in that it is quite inefficient at catching a hare. Uh, let alone when coupled with another, another greyhound. It is artificial in that there used to be several regional variations of the greyhounds in Great Britain, but the sport of coursing ensured that only the best fitted lines would survive. As to the sport at the time coursing was born, and as to the sport, it is a special in that the hair is central and instrumental at the same time. Since there can be no coursing without the hair, but coursing is a competition between the dogs only, and the killing of the hair is quite incidental. Now, in order to decide on the best uh, dog, and in order to decide on the best dog, uh, a set of rules was devised by the, the Duke of Norfolk in the second half of the 16th century at the command of Queen Elizabeth, according to legend. Now, it is clear from uh, reading the rules that the most deserving competitor is the dog who does most towards killing the hare. 
rather than merely kill the hair. The emphasis was on forcing the hair to move away from her straightest line towards her escape, as you can read from, from this uh, slide here, trying more than the other competitor to kill the hair, and uh, this uh, uh, to the utmost of uh, its uh, strength because the standing in the field is the greatest uh, foil a dog can take. Indeed, as with uh, any sport, coursing was designed to both constrain and promote specific movements and behavior. Now, in the original version of the rules, neither killing the hair nor uh, reaching the hair first were rewarded, except in case of a tie. So coursing enthusiasts simply wanted their dogs to display unflinching and selfish desire to kill the hair, as well as carriage. This is why, in the words of uh, yet another uh, writer in 1885, the greater the fool, the better the greyhound. Indeed, greyhounds hunt by sight only, so they have to concentrate all their energy on keeping the prey in sight and uh, reaching it before their opponent so that the two greyhounds catch up with the hare at formidable speed. And as the hare is much more agile, it invariably jerks sideways at the very last moment, which usually sends the dogs many meters past and forces them to make considerable effort in order to catch up with the hare over and over again. As uh, suggested by Shakespeare, I apologize for the shortcut, as suggested by Shakespeare himself, the Greyhound looks like an idealized metaphor of the warring qualities, the fallen knights of uh, the Middle Ages, which they were still endowed with. Indeed, as the preserve of the aristocracy from as far back as the first version of the forest laws in 1016, the ownership of greyhounds symbolized royal and aristocratic privileges. As to the hare coming just below the stag, it was the most aristocratic beast, whoever was legally entitled to kill game, but did not enjoy uh, royal favors, could uh, hunt. That is, landowners with a minimum income of 40 shillings, which matched exactly the, the land revenue above which the government recruited their justices of the peace, and the bourgeoisie, who began to play an increasing uh, role in the hunting world of the 15th and 16th uh, centuries. Therefore, the unleashing of two greyhounds on the hare was the most honorable hunting exercise common to both the landed elite and the aspiring new economic classes of 16th century England, a kind of competitive counterpart of the cooperative effort of hunting efforts, a means of competing among betters, as well as of uh, defining oneself as apart from those who were not entitled to take part at halfway stage of the so-called civilizing process uh, conceptualized by uh, Norbert Elias. However, ever since coursing was abolished in Scotland, uh, England, Wales, and Northern Ireland, the Republic of Ireland is the only country in the world where coursing is legal and uh, indulged in to any significant extent. Given the Englishness of this uh, sport, its uh, symbolism, the historical antagonism between the two islands, as well as the role of sports in defining Irishness as against Britishness, this is uh, paradoxical, to say the least. And for some Irish enthusiasts of coursing, this is because uh, coursing is the oldest uh, Irish national sport. However, such a view is difficult to sustain. Yet, Irish coursing does have claims to being uh, somewhat national, from several points of view, social, political, economic, and uh, eventually folkloric. Um, little is known about coursing before the creation of the National Coursing Club, the controlling authority for both Great Britain and, and Ireland in 1858. Uh, there used to be occasional coursing meetings, gathering the a social and political elite but my study of the number of coursing clubs shows that the development of this uh, sport in Ireland um, dates from the very end of the 19th century and first three decades of the 20th century. 
Given the period when it developed, it is tempting to see the rising popularity of Corsinga as a consequence of the land war, which saw a massive transfer of land ownership from a small landowning elite to a large group of small farmer owners. Indeed, the type of forcing organized in Great Britain required huge estates on which wealthy landowners would prepare to tolerate a high population of hares for uh, their winter leisure. In Ireland, the breaking up of such estates made this impossible to stage. In addition to that, it is very likely that once they were given the opportunity, Irish tenant farmers took to hunting with great relish, reducing the population of hares. This is what happened in, in England when the Grand Game Act of 1880 gave English farmers the right to kill game on their land. This caused a sharp decline in the number of heirs and forced many clubs to cease their operations. This, in turn, gave birth to an enclosed coursing where the uh, heirs raised on site uh, uh, were taught to run in a straight line towards the upper part of the field where they could take refuge from the greyhounds. Traditional courses were adamant in their criticism of uh, so-called park coursing, uh, which they saw as a perversion of uh, the original. And despite initial success with uh, new followers coming by train from nearby towns, the new entertainment did not live long. However, this is the very version of coursing that, uh, which has proved popular in Ireland except that the hares are not uh, raised on site, and that the winning dog is the dog that reaches the hare first, no matter how well and hard the other dog tries to snap the hare, which is very different from the original English version. <clears throat> Did every February, around 30,000 people flocked to the national coursing at Powerstone Park, a race course in Clonmel County Tipperary. For three days, it brings together the 128 animals that won their ticket at one of 64 qualifying meetings for a prize money worth £40,000 and eternal local glory. <laughs> Hares are netted in their natural habitat. They are locked up in an enclosure at one end of the field, and they are trained tra 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 to run in a straight line to the other end, as the Rev said. Uh, on the day of the competition, the pairs of grey hands are passed on to the slipper, then the hair is released, and once it has passed the screen behind which the slipper and the dogs have been hiding, the trio moves out the so-called uh, shy. And when the hare has a lead of 60 to uh, 80 meters, the, sleep, the slipper releases the dogs. Uh, in the crowded stands, just in front of where the greyhounds uh, reach the hare, the spectators cheer on the dog they have bet on with uh, one of the numerous bookmakers on attendance. The judge on horseback keeps level with the dogs during the, the race and signals the winner by holding up a handkerchief, the color of the winning dog's color. Uh, and a few days later, the hares are released back into the wild where they were netted. Now, even though such setting is not typical of all coursing held in Ireland, this picture showing course a, a, a coursing competition uh, taking place on GAA grounds points to some affinities between the two. Uh, indeed, for Thomas Morris, the most prominent uh, coursing official of the early 20th century in Ireland, in Ireland as a sport that built its success on the dismantling of great estates and extension of land's rights to the rural community, it is not without similarities with the role played by the GAA in the emancipation of the country. And especially so since recent research has shown that so-called gaming sports are part and parcel of the British sports revolution of the 19th century, and that very few, if any, of today's emblematically Irish sports are uh, originally, specifically so. Um, the parallel can even be stretched further on the political field. Indeed, conflicts were so numerous in Ireland that in 1906, the National Coursing Club decided to set up a subcommittee in charge of settling those conflicts. 
The Budget Controlling Authority grew so dissatisfied with its uh, working that on uh, the 13th of July 1960, it decided to take full control of Irish affairs again, barring those who did not comply from uh, competing. Now, it appears that the subcommittee deliberately triggered the crisis, and, and on August the 14th, 1916, like the GAA 32 years earlier, at the very same place in Thurles, delegates voted a resolution that enjoined the British National Coursing Club to place Irish coursing within the jurisdiction of an autonomous Irish body, or else face the possibility of Irish courses setting up their own statehood and pocketing the registration fees. As coursing in Ireland was as popular as in Great Britain, the British body was left with little choice but to comply or face bankruptcy. Therefore, three days before the expiry of the ultimatum, an extraordinary general meeting of the NCC ratified the creation of the Irish Coursing Club. The process, which was uh, symbolically started immediately after the rising, came to a logical end after the Anglo-Irish Treaty and uh, the Civil War with the publication of the first Irish Greyhound Study Book in 1923. <clears throat> now, economically, Greyhounds are not without claims to being national either. Indeed, although coursing greyhounds no longer have much in common with racing greyhounds, all the greyhounds that appeared on the first race tracks came de facto from coursing, and most of them came from Ireland. With the arrival of racing in Great Britain in 1926, the Irish Greyhound Start Book saw the number of new registrations rise from around 5,000 a year between 1923 and 1927 to 30,000 in 1929 and nearly 50,000 in 1947. And whereas in Great Britain, the National Coursing Club refused to manage the development of racing, which it considered the ultimate perversion of the original idea, and what they be too plebeian to its liking, in Ireland, where the two sports were attended by the same owners and spectators, the Irish Coursing Club was quick to place Greyhound Racing under its control. Now, even though opinions on the subject differ, the type of coursing organized in Ireland, which favors fast greyhounds over tough ones, probably also played a part. Whatever the case, throughout the period, from the appearance of greyhound racing to the immediate uh, end of the Second World War, the number of coursing clubs increased again, with Munster making up for a fall in Leinster. As one of the most rural and agricultural provinces of the country, it is very likely that breeding of greyhounds offered many small farmers an opportunity of living uh, uh, their um, austere daily lives in an alien economy. Uh, for some courses, there, there was uh, hardly a farm without the odd greyhound at the time. However, with the end of Second World War, and the lifting of the restrictions imposed during the Blitz, British dog tracks emptied of their spectators. As a result, this formidable export market dried up. This is uh, when and why, in 1958, uh, the Irish government passed the Greyhound Industry Act, which established Port Mugan, a semi-state body placed under the supervision of the Ministry of Agriculture. Indeed, in Irish law, the greyhound breed is not a dog, it is a farm animal, and greyhound breeding is an industry. Ever since that day, the Irish Greyhound Board, as it is now being called, has been in charge of the running and promotion of the greyhound industry, including breeding and coursing. As to the Irish Coursing Club, it has remained in charge of compiling the stud book, and it receives the financial resources generated by the activity. So that whoever owns and registers a greyhound in Ireland is an indirect contributor to the perpetuation of coursing in the Republic with the blessing of the state. Now, in addition to the social, political, and economic reasons for which uh, greyhound sports have been relatively so popular for so long in Ireland, it is also necessary to mention the fact that coursing has been able to take into account the growing sensitivity of the Irish population to the animal cause by agreeing in 1993 to have the greyhounds uh, muscled. 
when it came under pressure from Tony Gregory's bill to ban the practice. As a result, very few hairs die anymore. This is still too many for three quarters of the population. But in June 2016, for example, the bill to have the practice abolished in the DOI received just 20 votes in favor and 114 against. And all ministers in charge of coursing have defended this uh, sport as part of the country's popular culture. And it is a fact that Ireland has always been celebrated for uh, its greyhounds, beginning with Master McGrath, the most famous greyhound of all times, whose 1860s victories on English soil were celebrated in ballads as well as by the Dubliners themselves. And the dog was immortalized by a stone monument in Dungarton, County Waterford, where he was born, as well as a bronze statue in Lurgan, County Armagh, where he spent his short life in the property of the Lord of the Place. And in spite of the denials of the committee in charge of designing the new Irish Parliament in 1928, many enthusiasts, as well as the Waterford Museum, um, persist in seeing uh, the old sixpenny coin as a commemoration of the famous Greyhound rather than as an Irish Wolfhound. Ireland is also the birthplace of Mick the Miller, the first racing superstar born at Kilae near Tullamore, County Oxford, at Father Brothers Place. There again, a life uh, a life size bronze statue of Mick the Miller was inaugurated by the prime by the then prime minister Brian Cohen in uh, 2011. As a matter of fact. Even though it is the responsibility of the Ministry for Agriculture, the survival of coursing is now highly dependent on the Ministry for Arts and Heritage. Um, however, it is the preservation of the hair, not its social, political, or economic history that has earned coursing a place in this ministry. Indeed, every coursing meeting has to obtain a license delivered by this government department to catch the hairs necessary for running the competition. Yet, apart from uh, conservation issues, the hair also has a place of choice in the Irish animal world. Uh, it will feature on the three pence coins of the new national coinage that followed the uh, Anglo Irish Treaty of 1991, 1921. Mm -hmm. This is mainly because in Celtic mythology and Irish folklore, uh, hares are widely believed to have connections with the other world. Uh, indeed, the Folklore Commission collected many stories of witches taking the shape of a hare to steal milk from cows and people, Fire, firing at her with a gun loaded with a crooked sixpence, there again, um, or there we are setting a greyhound on her, preferably on May the 1st. This might be because in Celtic mythology, there used to be a met metaphorical uh, equivalence and relationship between woman and nature as givers of life. I am, I am using here the work of Sylvie Buea, the wren, life and death in the ritual and Irish tales, an essay on the evolution of representations of nature, culture, and male-female relationships. According to her, the Celtic calendar was fashioned on the moon, which undergoes in one month what nature and women go through in one year. And as the yielding of fruit was logically seen as the end of the natural cycle, the year began on the 1st of November, which marked the beginning of winter. The second quarter marked the beginning of the agricultural year, and the third, the passage from flower to fruit. Therefore, Nature was thought to reproduce life thanks to the rotting process vegetation went through in winter. And given the metaphorical equivalence between nature and women, women were thought to reproduce life thanks to the blood they no longer shed when pregnant. So much so that uh, men and nature were thought to entertain and exchange relationships. Nature fed men in their lifetime, then the decaying bodies of dead men fed nature. Similarly, the blood of women fed nature when menstrual and babies to be born when used for gestation. Life and the alternation of seasons were made possible thanks to blood. 
and such a clear parallel was drawn, was drawn between the fertility of women and that of nature that it was necessary that men take a bloodbath in winter in order to impregnate it. This is why the supreme king, uh, the supreme Celtic king, as the representative of mankind, used to be ritualistically put to death as a sacrifice to nature for nature to be able to feed his people again. Later on, as humans came to think of themselves as apart from nature, the supreme king was replaced by a wren, chased, killed, and paraded by young men on the bush decorated with ribbons as a symbol of nature and menstruation, that is, uh, as a symbol of uh, the wheel of the year that needs blood to, uh, to turn. Now, even though no similar traditional festival has ever taken place, it is possible to uh, hypothesize that the hunting or coursing of hares with dogs partake of the same symbolism as uh, suggested by the North Kilkenny Coursing Club, as well as by a list of writer Brian McMahon, whose, whose novel Children of the Rainbow opens up on the coursing field in the fictional Kerry village of Clun in the 1920s, where a white marked hare festooned with ribbons is released and uh, eventually takes the reader back into a pre-colonization, pre-Christian, enthusiastic island in which bloodshed is necessary for life to be reborn. Now, as a symbolic and ritual representation of menstruation, hairs are beneficial when, when earth is in need of blood, but for blood to turn into milk, it is necessary that they should be sent underground in order to feed earth with their own blood and make way for summer before the 1st of May. After that day, the spilling of blood was likely to trigger a counterclockwise uh, reaction from mid to blood or, or summer to winter and spread fruitlessness. However, logically enough, as Sylvie Muller explains, the more humans came to think of themselves as apart from nature, the more males came to think of themselves as apart from females and think, and think of themselves as the guardians of the retention, but also the shedding of women's blood. This might be one in, uh, in some probably later version of the sucking hair story, uh, the witch has turned into a young woman, and why in Children of the Rainbow, the coursing field is highly sexualized, and why Tommy Conlon in the Sunday Independent of February the 10th, 2002, could write of muscle greyhounds as eunuchs in a harem of hairs. <laughs> That's it. <laughs> Thank you so much for your talk. Um, we still have five minutes left for questions as we start at like three, um, 11. So, um, are there any questions? <laughs> I, I don't have a, a question, but yeah. I have a story from my family that might be of interest. Uh, my, my, when my mother was born in 1936, uh, the story her father told, this is a North rural restaurant, so not far from Sligo. So uh, you know, back then you would have to go get the midwife. And, you know, babies are often born in the middle of the night. That's, and so my, my grandfather, whom I never met, he always told the story that when my, my his wife was in labor with my mother, when he was running to get the midwife, it got very, very misty. And he was lost because he's going across fields. He's not going on a road. Two ghostly greyhounds appeared, <laughs> one on either side, and led him to the midwife. <laughs> what a wonderful story. <laughs> 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 Any other stories? Not one. Not to questions. I'm going to be the last one. I just wondered, blood sports get a very bad rap, um, particularly in animal studies. And um, I was just interested in how your um, presentation of coursing allowed 
have a lot of sympathy with the causing pro causing lobby. Um, how that feels as a as a relationship. Uh, how do you, you know you spoke very eloquently of the legislative frameworks that are now happening with passage from agriculture, if you like, and into the like, cultural arts and heritage department. And that is obviously a kind of ideological shift as well. So I just wanted to invite you to speak a little bit more about that. Oh, well, um, well, I well, actually, I, I skipped a conclusion which said, uh, and I think that it's going to answer uh, your question. Uh, if uh, Sylvie Muller's work is anything to go by, and if there is anything like a civilizing process, forcing looks like being well past its usefulness. And it's probably time, if not for the hair, if not for the 6,000 greyhounds or so who are an, an accounting for every year, according to the famous RT documentary, that calls him the abandoned. Not saying bad, but abandoned. Okay, and thank you so much.